My name is Mike Buckley, and I'm going to be walking you through the PID control of a 3D printer's gantry system. So as an overview, we're going to be looking at physical system design, software and hardware integration, system modeling, tuning, basic computing, and system development. Looking at our physical system design, we're going to be looking at a 3D printer with a gantry system that uh, operates in Cartesian space. It's going to be actuated with a DC motor coupled to a lead screw. And that lead screw will have a carriage that our printing head is mounted to. Taking a closer look at the lead screw assembly, uh, we have our DC motor at the terminal end that again is coupled to the lead screw. As the motor turns, it advances the carriage, which has the printing head mounted to it. Also mounted to the carriage, we have an encoder, which is essentially going to be acting as our uh, position sensor. So then looking at our software and hardware integration, we have to ask ourselves, what's good performance for this system? So we have two priorities here. The first is to reach the set point while minimizing uh, positional overshoot. So what that's going to do is it prevents uh, crashing at the rails limits on your lead screw assembly, also minimizes dynamic forces that the system is going to experience due to deceleration. Uh, the second priority is reaching your set point as fast as possible. Uh, when you do this, it's going to de decrease your print time. And um, just one thing to remember is this is really a nice to have feature. So it is second priority to priority one. And we're gonna map out our system. So how are we going to control it? Well, it's going to use a PID controller that um, fits into a traditional uh, feedback loop, a closed loop that is. And while this is an um, inherent uh, or necessary for our um, uh, coming up with our dynamic system model or our governing equations, it is useful to understand the forces on the carriage. So in the horizontal direction, we have the thrust force coming from the lead screw. Opposing that, we have frictional force uh, that comes between the carriage and the rails. In the vertical direction, we have the weight pressing down from the carriage and print head. And then opposing that, we have uh, an equal but opposite force uh, as the vertical normal force. Then we get into our governing equations. So we're gonna be looking at uh, two sets of governing equations, essentially, ones that govern the motor and ones that, well, just one that governs the lead screw. Looking at the motor equations, uh, we have uh, torque development, conservation of energy in the form of uh, voltage conservation. We have a back EMF voltage, develop power and mechanical dynamics that relates torque and uh, motor speed. Looking at the lead screw, we have uh, a linear position that's based on the motor's um, rotational position. So then uh, how do we combine these governing equations to uh, work in our feedback loop? So to do that, we're going to take those governing equations, manipulate them to obtain the equations you see here, um, perform Laplace transforms on those new equations and solve them to uh, get all of these transfer functions. And what these transfer functions are going to do is take some input signal and transform it into a proper output signal. So for example, here in the first one, if we input um, a voltage, it will output a current. So all of these transfer functions uh, follow that kind of rule. But uh, looking at all those equations, it's kind of unintuitive uh, how they actually operate and interact with each other. So what I've done here is I've created a model in Simulink to demonstrate how all of them interact. And you'll notice that in the beginning of this loop, you have a, uh, an input voltage that gets transformed eventually into a uh, motor speed. And then you actually have um, a uh, voltage subtracted from the signal uh, based on the uh, 
back EMF coming from the, the motor. So after you have your uh, rotational velocity, that gets transformed into uh, motor position and then therefore carriage position. And again, even all of that is rather unwieldy. So what we're going to do is combine all of those transfer functions into one final system transfer function. And that's what we have here. So the next step is um, looking at our tuning strategy. So this is one model that I like to use or one tuning strategy I like to use. Uh, that's going to be creating your model in Simulink as the first step. Uh, second step, you're going to use the auto-tune function uh, in your PID block. And from there, you can adjust uh, system, system response time and transient behavior. And what you're going to do there is you're going to want to minimize overshoot and um, maximize response time. So you're going to get a, a fast response while um, minimizing overshoot. The next step is going to be doing physical testing. So you build your Simulink model and then uh, you're going to actually prototype this device. So when you do that, you're looking at your system response. In our case, it's um, really we're looking at the carriage, making sure that it reaches its uh, target destination. So if the carriage uh, reaches its destination uh, too slowly, increase your proportional gain on your PID controller. If your um, a uh, carriage overshoots its target and has to come back to reach the proper position, increase your derivative gain. And then if your printer head does not reach the uh, proper position once it's at its steady state, you're going to need to adjust the integral gain. And then uh, when you're tuning, um, choosing these PID values can help you avoid uh, non-linearity situations. So what we're going to avoid is uh, exceeding our motor's critical speed. Um, that will send us into a nonlinear or unexpected region. We're going to want to uh, avoid attempting to produce torque greater than the motor stall current. That way we can always uh, be predictably outputting torque. Um, and then finally, we're going to want to avoid exerting force on the carriage that's going to yield or fracture any of the components in your system. So now we're gonna look at basic computing, which is pretty much going to be a Simulink model or mock-up of our system. So as you can see here, we have our reference position, which I have set to five inches or 0.127 meters. Uh, that is fed into our PID controller, which is then fed into a, um, our system transfer function. From there, we get a feedback signal of the position that is measured by an encoder. And then uh, that signal is actually then passed through a notch filter that's uh, filtering out signals that are oscillating at 60 Hertz. Um, that's pretty much just to get rid of uh, oscillations coming from the power grid, at least in the United States. Um, and then that'll uh, repeat and uh, through the loop. And then eventually we will get a, um, in output position for our printer head. So uh, unfortunately, when I implemented this, um, uh, this model and ran the simulation, uh, for whatever reason, the output position uh, diverged to infinity, which obviously uh, isn't great. So I uh, did a little troubleshooting with the system and uh, what ended up fixing the error was uh, if you turned the uh, reference position to a negative and turned the sum block into uh, a plus going in from the reference position and then a plus coming from the uh, sensor signal, uh, the system behaved as expected and that caused the system to converge to the reference position. So that uh, convergence to the reference position is represented by this plot here, uh, the dependent axis being time and the uh, dependent axis being position of the printer head. So the final thing we're gonna be looking at is system development. So here 
uh, we're going to be taking another look at troubleshooting. And really, this is going to be the same troubleshooting technique that we took from the uh, PID tuning uh, section of this. So uh, you're going to take a, a look at your physical system after you've prototyped it, and you're going to want to ensure a, a couple different following conditions. You want to ensure that the printer produces adequate print cycle times. If it doesn't, increase your proportional gain. Want to ensure that there's not excessive positional overshoot, uh, something that's uh, causing material failure. If there is, if this is happening, you want to increase your derivative gain. And then if your printer is not reaching the proper position, you're going to want to adjust your integral gain. Another thing to look at is drift. So while the um, encoder provides positional feedback throughout um, uh, the control system, uh, it can, sensors often do drift over time. So to prevent this, we'll want to calibrate the machine every once in a while. Uh, that can be done by having some home position where the system recognizes its home limit switches. Another thing to watch out for is uh, the motor overheating. So it gets pretty hot inside a 3D printer. The printer head um, heats up to uh, allow the printer to create um, these prints. So we'll just want to make sure that the motor is um, sufficiently cool throughout its operation. Finally, we're gonna, uh, we have to think about ethics. So 3D printers can actually replace the jobs of traditional model makers, uh, people that use clay to create models uh, for companies. Uh, a lot of the times car manufacturers will have um, clay models of their cars. So one thing that the company could do if they were going to um, be making this kind of business decision is to retrain their model makers as CAD operators. And that way it ensures that uh, these people can keep some kind of job at the company. So that wraps up our look at PID control of a 3D printer gantry system. Uh, thank you for your time and thanks for listening.